Hello and welcome to the official opening event of the 2020 Chiswick Book Festival. We'd normally be face to face with about 200 of you in the Burlington Pavilion just outside the house and I'm sad that we can't be meeting in person. But we've done the next best thing and in some ways better because we're actually filming inside Chiswick House in the wonderful Upper Tribunal or Dome Saloon as it may be better known. Thanks to the team at Chiswick House and Gardens Trust for letting us do this, and to Chiswick Buzz, without whom we simply could not put on the festival in this way, and to our loyal sponsor of our Chiswick House events, the Art Society Chiswick, without whom we couldn't afford to put it on. The last time we were in this room for the Chiswick Book Festival was in 2011, before the Pav Burlington Pavilion was even a glimpse in the wedding planner's eye. Our speaker on that occasion was Lucy Worsley in the days before she was quite so famous and we could only accommodate 80 people. The following year we forsook history and embraced a larger audience outside. Today I'm delighted that we're able to put on the event we always hope to stage on this day here, inspired by the fact that Hogarth's eight paintings of A Rake's Progress have returned to Pitshanger Manor in Ealing for the first time in 200 years on loan from Sir John Soane's Museum. With perfect timing, the exhibition that should have been open between March and July has now opened today, albeit with limited capacity because of COVID-19. We'll be showing you the pictures and hearing how and why they went away and have come back. The title of the session is 21st Century Influencers, Hogarth, Soane and A Rake's Progress and we have a terrific panel to discuss why and how all three remain so influential in the 21st century. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panellists, Pitshanger Manor's director Claire Goff, on Zoom John Collins, Heritage Manor of William Hogarth Trust, and the new director of Chiswick House and Gardens Trust, Xanthi Arvanitakis, who used to hold a senior role at Sir John Soane's Museum. Finally, I'm delighted to welcome the cartoonist Martin Rosen, who has helped to keep Hogarth's memory alive in our daily prints and papers and online. I'd normally invite you to applaud them, so please feel free to do so at home, even though we can't hear you. I'll be asking each of them to talk initially about their own area of expertise, and then we'll open up the panel for discussion. So I'm starting with Claire Goff, whose contribution we filmed on Monday at Pitshanger Manor in front of the paintings themselves, which was a real treat. She's also here in person to join in the discussion, but let's now watch her introduce the paintings and explain why they were there and why they've come back. Hello and a very warm welcome to Pitshanger Manor and Gallery, where I am thrilled that at long last we have finally been able to open our exhibition Hogarth, London Voices, London Lives, after 25 long weeks of lockdown. This is the exhibition that we had hoped to open in March, but we are thrilled now to have it open to the public. It is terribly exciting for me to be standing next to Hogarth's wonderful series of paintings, A Rake's Progress. These have been brought back to Pitsanger for the first time in 200 years, very generously loaned to us by the Sir John Soane Museum. In 1802, Mrs. Soane, Eliza Soane, went off to Christie's and bought these at auction for 570 guineas. And after a short display at a dinner party at um, Soane's home in Lincoln's Inn Fields, they were brought back to Pitsanger to be part of the core of the, the display of exhibits that, that Soane was building up. He wanted to use Pitsanger to show his, his wonderfully eclectic collection, ranging from antiquities through to what was very modern art for the time. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of, um, of the Rake's Progress, very familiar to so many of you, and then also tell you a little bit about how, how Soane um, displayed them here at Pitsinger. So as I'm sure you're aware, the story tells the rather sad tale of um, the progress of Tom Rakewell, who inherited a huge fortune from his miserly father and then frittered it away. And it tells his tale of descending into debt and extravagant social climbing, finally um, ending in a debtor's prison, then getting madness through syphilis and dying at the madhouse in Bethlehem. It's a wonderful story portrayed across eight panels. And um, um, the filmmaker Alan Parker once described it as the first storyboard, um, as, it, as it depicts each stages um, in the story. 
Stone loved Hogarth's paintings. Um, he equated him, Hogarth, to, um, to Shakespeare in his way of being able to describe the human condition in all its frailty. And Soane's acquisition of these paintings both cemented Soane's position as a collector of great British works, but also really helped to boost Hogarth's own reputation as a painter, not just what he was so well known for at the time, as a, as a maker of wonderful prints. So when Soane brought these wonderful paintings to Pitsanger, he specifically designed a wonderful paint colour to hang them against in the small drawing room at Pitsanger. He wanted all of his visitors to come, it would be the first room that they would have visited as they, as they, as they came to Pitsanger. And he chose an incredibly vibrant red, a Venetian red, to hang them against. And we've tried to recreate that as closely as possible here. And I think you'll agree it shows the paintings off to perfection. If you come to visit Pitsanger, you'll see the wonderful red uh, that he created in the small drawing room. And it is so vibrant and it's created by having an incredibly strong orange underpaint that gives the, um, the Venetian red such its, 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 its incredibly strong colour. So here we have the orgy scene. There's Tom being distracted by um, one of the ladies while his pocket is picked to, um, to the left. So lots of, lots of signs in this from, um, from Hogarth um, picking up, um, touching on the morality of the time. So you'll notice that many of the women have black spots and they are to cover syphilitic sores that they had, um, had developed. So the orgy is the third out of the eight paintings, and I'm afraid from then for Tom Wakewell, things go from worse to worse before he finally ends up in the lunatic asylum at Bethlehem. So what we have done in the exhibition Hogarth London Voices London Lives is we've juxtaposed Hogarth's inspirational series of paintings, Rake's Progress, with contemporary works that reflect on live the challenges of living in London today. A rate of progress has been inspirational for so many contemporary artists, ranging from Grace and Perry, David Hockney through to Yinka Shonabare. But we've decided instead to pick up on some of the themes that are touched on in the paintings. Um, I'm standing here next to a wonderful photograph by the contemporary photographer John Riddy, and it's a photograph of the exterior of the Garrick Club. Now indeed, Hogarth and Garrick, the actor Garrick, were great friends and Hogarth painted a portrait of Garrick at the height of his acting fame. And we've got a series of paintings by John that look at different images of London, some of them rather more gritty than this one of, um, of, of the um, Garrick Club. And next door as you go into the main gallery, you'll see a range of, um, of pieces by contemporary artists picking up on these challenges of living in London today. So for instance, one of them is by Ruth Ewan, a set of protest posters that pick up on some of the themes that are perhaps more subtly hidden within a rate's progress. So we really encourage people to come and look at the rate's progress as context for this contemporary look at life in London today. It's interesting to remember that a rate's progress was a modern series of paintings when Soane bought them. They were about 60 years old. And so he bought them and wanted them in his collection to inspire the visitors to his house with the art that he saw, much in the same way that he collected pieces by Inigo Jones, the architect, to inspire visitors. He wanted to inspire people with British art. I very much hope with this display of Hogarth showing how it has been a contemporary inspiration for us and in the selection of the artists that we have displayed around it, it will be just as much an inspiration for you today. So Hogarth London Voices London Lives is open at Pitsanger Manor and Gallery from now and you can visit it Thursday through to Sundays. Unfortunately all tickets do need to be pre-booked because of our Covid planning so um, you can book online at pitsanger.org.uk. Thank you so much Claire, that set us up absolutely beautifully and I have to say it was a total treat to be allowed in uh, to stand next to the pictures. I last saw them at uh, the Sir John Soane Museum just before lockdown when they were part of another wonderful exhibition of, of, of lots of, uh, of, of the Hogarths. Uh, and uh, 
I knew then that they were coming. I thought I must see them in their old uh, location. And I have to say, and Claire won't mind me saying this, they look far better uh, at Pitts Hanger than they did there. And you've got every opportunity uh, uh, to see them. So anyway, we'll pick up with Claire and, and the rest of our panel uh, on some of the points uh, there. But our next speaker uh, is John Collins. He's the heritage manager of Hogarth's House and the William Hogarth Trust, who describe themselves as the supporters club for William Hogarth. And uh, you can't go anywhere in Chiswick without bumping into something named after Hogarth. Uh, he's buried in, in the church, uh, St. Nicholas Church uh, down the road, a wonderful uh, tomb there. We uh, have um, uh, a statue of him in Chiswick High Road. And we also have the legendary Hogarth Roundabout, which has been immortalised by one of our other panellists, uh, uh, Martin Rosen, as a cartoon. And it's an absolutely fantastic evocation of William Hogarth's style, but uh, transplanted into the chaos of, uh, uh, of modern Chiswick. The modern Chiswick out there, rather than the peaceful modern Chiswick uh, in here. So uh, John Collins is going to speak to us on Zoom. Uh, I will then pick up uh, from him after that. And thank you, Torin. Um, I'm here to talk particularly about the relevance of Hogarth today in relation to Hogarth's house, his former home in Chiswick, uh, the house which is a historic house now open to the public that I manage. So I think it's difficult to uh, pick a starting point for the many places with which Hogarth continues to be relevant to our visitors and thankfully keeps them coming through the door. Um, I think it's important to mention that our collection is one of lots of Hogarth prints. It's a wide range in collection from some of the best well-known works to some of the lesser well-known works and this really affords us quite an opportunity because those prints are very detailed, often much more detailed than the paintings themselves are and they allow Hogarth to show London from every strata of society and you get to see that society in action. You talk about things of excessive drinking, of poverty, uh, ideas of exploitation, he has issues of animal welfare in his prints, and some very well-observed looks at the political class. Um, personally, for me, as someone who spent the last six months working from home, uh, to be able to see lesser-known prints like The Enraged Musician from 1741, where a violinist is driven crazy by the sounds coming out of his window, feels particularly pertinent. And it's those links that often are made by visitors who get time to, up close to study a wide variety of Hogarth's prints, from the very well-known to the lesser-known, as I say. But it also helps us in terms of our programming as well. In terms of when we put together exhibits using the house's collection and have special exhibitions, We've got all sorts of starting points that are still relevant to people in society today and looking through the prism of Hogarth in the 18th century about how those issues have changed and how they continue to be the same. Another important aspect for us is the number of international visitors that we have, which is actually pretty high, or at least it was before lockdown. And we find a lot of feedback from these international visitors is in the same way that to many, the literary perception of a historic London is one that comes through Dickens, that Hogarth provides the same kind of perspective of a historic London, but in a visual term rather than a literary term and it's a consistent theme that we get across international visitors particularly those that seem to come from Japan, Germany and Italy. But further than that as well we've at the house just uh, been reaching the final stages of completing a heritage lottery funded refurbishment where we'll have a new garden and a learning studio. That learning studio will be filled with learning activities for all sorts of audiences, but particularly for schools. And local schools, both primary and secondary, have been very keen to be involved, both as a way to understand a historic figure in the local area, but also as well to use some of the issues that come up across Hogarth's works, as I've already spoken about, that can be applied across the curriculum from history to art and even into sciences as well. That opportunity to place Hogarth at the centre of the modern curriculum for those schools engaging with us is one that's really exciting and does show the way that Hogarth continues to be relevant in the modern world. But schools are really embracing the opportunity to address the issues that are raised in a great many of Hogarth's prints and to help their children to understand how issues that affect society and how social justice is still relevant today. So for us, there's a lot of uh, crossovers that continue to make us a relevant site. And it's very much helped by things like uh, the BBC's recent series Harlots, which the introduction to has lots of little coloured cutouts of images from Hogarth prints. So Hogarth continues to be relevant across society, even if a lot of people don't immediately know that he is. 
I can now uh, introduce Martin Rosen. I'm absolutely delighted you, you're here. Obviously, we've known your work for years and years, but um, he's been an inspiration to you, uh, I know, Hogarth, uh, and keeps being an inspiration. But I'm going to ask you why that should be, but also how. How did you first come across William Hogarth? Uh, Hogarth played a, an essential role in a moment when I was 10 years old, when I had this kind of... Damascene moment when I opened my sister's history school textbook, which was the illustrated history of Great Britain 1750 to 1950, which was illustrated throughout with cartoons, what we now call cartoons, though the phrase, the word in the modern meaning wasn't coined until 1842 in Punch. And so there was Hogarth, there was Gilray, there was Rowlandson, there was Crookshank, there was Teniel, all the way up to David Lowe. And I just thought these were the most wonderful things I'd ever seen in my life. And I remember going to my father's old desk and getting out some old steel nibs and trying to cross-hatch in the way that Gilray and Hogarth etched and engraved, and then started finding out about these people. And um, I just mentioned David Lowe, the great 20th century political cartoonist who worked for the Evening Standard. Um, at the top of the Gestapo death list of British cartoonists who were going to be shot on sight should the Nazis have invaded Britain, um, who said that Gilray was the father of the political cartoon, but Hogarth was the grandfather. And um, although Hogarth, I think, probably only did about four specifically political cartoons right at the beginning and right at the end of his career, uh, there was something about him in his social cartooning uh, which set the template, which actually created the form. It's like the type specimen for, for a cartoon. And that's because, at heart, although Claire's been showing us these wonderful paintings, most people would have known those paintings through the engravings he did afterwards. So he got paid twice, apart from anything else. Um, and in that way, he was a journalist. I never called myself an artist. I'm, I'm a visual journalist. Uh, and what he was doing, he was doing not to be hung up in galleries or in grand houses like this, but to be distributed to as large a number of people as possible. And in fact, he had different kinds of print. So for example, the fine good work like Marriage Out of Mode, we print it on expensive paper. Things like Gin Lane, which I think is the most important image of the 18th century, actually, uh, were printed on cheap paper because they were there to be disseminated specifically as a polemical act. And he produced Gin Lane uh, as part of a campaign he and Henry Fielding were uh, put on to deal with the terrible blight of gin which was destroying the London underclass, in their opinion. Uh, and uh, it was rather nicely published on my minus hundred and uh, 211th birthday, on the 15th of February, 1751. And um, it's like a tabloid headline. It's showing the dangers of gin the terrible effects it has, you know, babies being impaled, a baby famously falling down a stairwell out of the arms of its mother, who, uh, you know, is so drunk she hasn't even noticed. But then you, when you delve into it, and the thing about Hogarth, he's like Gilray, you can step into one of his engravings or his paintings, and you can keep walking for a week, and you're still finding new stuff. But specifically in Gin Lane, he's making a polemical point against the evils of gin. He is doing it in a journalistic way because this was produced to be reproduced. The original of Gin Lane no longer exists. It was a, it was a, a sheet of metal. Um, he was doing it with humour. And that's where all the three aspects of a modern cartoon come together. They're visual, they're journalism, and they're using humour. Because although Gin Lane appears to be very, very dark, it's full of all these little incidental details um, of dark slapstick. Um, babies being impaled, babies falling down stairwells. But also the centre of it is a gag. The middle of it is a gag. That drunken woman is a pastiche of one of the most celebrated images or icons of Christianity, which is the Madonna and Child. But this Madonna is so drunk, she is dropping the hope of redemption down the stairwell. I've always thought it's interesting that you can actually go to where Gin Lane was in the, in the rookeries around St. Giles. And it's geographically about 300 yards from Fagin's Kitchen, in Oliver Twist, uh, and it's about 80 years earlier. And they're completely different. There is an absolute difference between a Dickensian slum and a Hogarthian slum. 
In his book, The Fatal Shore, about the first Australian penal settlements, um, Robert Hughes, the Australian art critic, referred to Georgian London as having Hogarthian slums, an art form in in themselves. They weren't just squalid, it was Hogarthian squalor. And in a Dickensian slum, you have hope, and then you have dashed hope, and you have pity, and you cry. In a Hogarthian slum, there is no hope whatsoever. You can see it in Gin Lane, the Christ child, the Redeemer, is falling down a stairwell to his death. There is no hope of redemption. You're surrounded by horror and squalor and appalling degradation and misery and drunkenness and murder, and all you can do is laugh. And I think that's a a wonderful example of not only of an 18th century attitude, but of a sort of general attitude about why we laugh. We laugh at the bad things that happen to us. We We don't need to laugh at the good things. We laugh at the bad things to stop us going insane with existentialist terror. And nowadays we may think that's a bit rough, just in the same way as we think the last book of Gulliver's Travels is, is, a, is you know, too strong, but the Georgians had stronger stomachs than us. And Hazlitt, you know, um, 80 years after Hogarth, was saying, Hogarth is hilariously funny. And he is hilariously funny. And that's why he's the, father of the, political, the grandfather of the political cartoon. And did he have a huge influence in his own time? And then did oh, yeah. I, mean, or, Gil, or, yeah, I mean, Gilray was massively influenced by Hogarth. Everybody was influenced by Hogarth. And you can tell how much he was influenced because of the way his career ended, where everybody turned on him. Um, He'd he'd started doing, he'd become sergeant painter to the king, um, massively ambitious. Uh, He becomes firmly entrenched in the establishment which he had been satirizing for the previous 40 years. And he did a pro-government cartoon, um, which everybody hated. Everybody turned on him. He did a... A, a, a wonderful caricature of John Wilkes during Wilkes's trial for seditious libel, um, where he turned Wilkes into this kind of uh, sinister, sexually charged, priapic satyr. And Wilkes's followers just expropriated this and started reproducing it and using it to promote their man. And Wilkes got his um, Charles Churchill, who was a, uh, this is a wonderful job description, a, a, a syphilitic spoilt priest poetaster to write the epistle uh, to Hogarth, which contains this wonderful quatrain, Hogarth Hogarth drawing Wilkes during the trial, standing at the back of the court, drawing him, saying, virtue with due contempt saw Hogarth stand his poisonous pencil in his palsied hand. It more or less describes how I work every day. And um, Hogarth, rather than ignoring this, answered back, he he fed the trolls. He burnished out his own (coughs) self-portrait of him and Trump the dog, and put in instead Churchill as a drunken bear with Trump the dog pissing on the epistle to Hogarth. And then Hogarth attacked him again, and then um, Churchill re-attacked, and it carried on. And Hogarth went to his grave, a comparatively young man, I I think he was 64, um, 66 rather, I mean, and he was a broken man. He was completely broken because he thought, why are they doing this to me? Why are they attacking me like this? Because I am the great Hogarth. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's like in, in um, Tristram Shandy, where Yorick, the priest, you know, is the mortgagee is the, to the mortgager as the jester is to the jester, so that you, you, you get paid back in interest. Mm-hmm. And so it happened to Hogarth, um, which I hope doesn't happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, as John mentioned, Hogarth's house is just up the road. I mean, next door neighbours uh, here. Uh, did he do much drawing and painting there, or was this just a place to relax? Or well, I think this, this was his retreat in the country. Uh, I mean, he. The other thing about him is, is he had a great sense of ironical absurdity. He and three of his friends friends went on a grand tour in 1734 but they went on a grand tour of the Isle of Sheppey. Uh, so they were in the pub one night, and they just got a Thames boatman to row them down to Sheppey, where they just went on a four-day pub crawl. And uh, I recreated that a few years ago with Giles Corrin, amongst other people. Um, and I think he rather liked the idea of this thing, of Hogarth's house next to Chiswick House being his grand country residence. Because uh, he was very bourgeois and, and self-consciously bourgeois. You know, he was not aristocratic. He was producing stuff which could be hung in houses like this, but could also be hung in print form on the houses of apprentices and the middle classes, and would frequently depict himself 
not wearing a wig. There is a famous portrait, self-portrait of him in his full bottom wig, but the one he preferred was of him as the self-made common man, not wearing his wig, just wearing a small cap. And, and that's a very self-conscious thing. And so him self-consciously having his small house next to Chiswick House, I think, was another of his gags. That's lovely. Th thanks, Martin. We'll come back to lots of those issues. So I'm turning to Zanthi now, who wasn't going to be originally part of our panel because she wasn't even uh, here when we first conceived uh, the idea of this. But she arrived as director of Chiswick uh, House uh, just before lockdown. Uh, how cruel is that? Uh, but she has worked at Sir John Soane's Museum and she worked particularly uh, on uh, the idea that he had huge influence. Um, and of course that is the topic we want. We've heard about Hogarth. What was Sir John Soane's influence on architecture, on anything? So, um, I mean, interestingly, sort of listening to what you're saying, I suppose I think the thing about Sir Johnson is he also had quite a humble sort of start to life. So everyone knows the story, and he was the son of a bricklayer. His, um, he got apprenticed through um, um, relationships that his uncle and his father had with architects, and he sort of went up through the ranks as an apprentice, got sponsored, won a gold medal, went on a grand tour, and really it was part of... He went on the proper grand tour. As part of the grand tour that he really sort of got acquainted with the aristocrats and the upper classes that were then going to be his clients for the rest of his um, working life. And in fact, I think one of the fascinating um, bits of research that's been done over the years is that you can trace pretty much all the work that he did back to that original grand tour. So that really was his making um, as, a, as an architect. So we all know that he was of the kind of the neoclassical genre and he was obviously very influenced um, by um, the grand tour. But he was also um, a, a sort of, I, I, in some ways I always think, and, 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 but I, you know, I'm coming at it as the, as, the, as the non curator, as the person that was working with his works and then working with commercial partners. So he was, um, in some ways, a sort of creative entrepreneur. So not only was he doing these sort of grand houses, but he was also experimenting. And he was a real experimenter with um, and the manipulation of space and light. So that was really his um, passion about how you can play with the shapes of rooms and the use of windows and openings and non-openings and mirrors and reflection to sort of to um, surprise you when you go into a space. As part of his kind of um, growth as an architect and becoming more famous, he became um, a, a, um, a Royal Academician and he became um, a teacher, so he became part of the kind of the cadre of, of the kind of Royal Academicians, along with Turner, who, who he shared, another local, who he shared um, his essay, they you know, used to sort of share their um, lectures with. Um, and as part of that, he, um, in some ways, that stimulated his collection because he was very conscious that for a lot of his students, they wouldn't be able to have the same um, experiences that he had and the same influences. So he became this massive collector. So he collected art, which we're talking about today, um, and in fact he had two um, Hogarth series. He had um, the Rake's Progress, but he also had the Election series, another brilliant series. Um, but he also collected a lot of classical fragments. So because he didn't have the big neoclassical mansion himself, what he actually did was kind of collect these kind of pieces or, or fragments of um, classical um, some originals, some replicas, and created these spaces as influence in, to influence his students and um, visitors. So as part of his um, growth as an architect, he bought these three properties in Lincolnson Field, knocked them down and reconstructed um, them to create essentially his museum. And whilst he was alive, he was already ticketing and, and welcoming people into his house as a museum. So he really was a kind of an entrepreneur and, a, and an influencer really right back in those early days. Um, Pitts Hanger, as we know, is the kind of the country residence. Um, and I think one of the kind of the ironies, actually, of the, um, of, of the Rake's progress and its positioning at Pitts Hanger is, is that's where Eliza, his wife, brought their two sons, John and George, down um, for you know, holidays, weekends, whatever, you know, whatever they did in those days. Um, so the boys grew up with this sort of moralistic um, set of um, artworks. And of course, George, his younger son, completely let him down and, and ended his life in debtor's prison, being paid off by Eliza, which, um, and, and then ended, ended up sort of um, writing this dreadful piece about Soane, and that was um, 
um, seen as the kind of causing the end of Eliza's life. So Soane at that point was triggered to get this private act and um, give the house to the nation. And in some ways, I always wonder if part of his influence wasn't just from when he was a practicing architect himself, but also his obsession with his own legacy and his need to protect his legacy, that by creating the house um, and the private act um, prevented anyone from um, ever, um, you know, the fact that the, the rake's progress has traveled at all is amazing because the whole principle of the act is that all the artworks, everything within the house must remain as it was when he died. So in some ways, that um, act in itself is what I, in, you know, my view, in my personal view, is it's probably helped create him, uh, you know, enshrine him as the influencer today because he's one of the few people that has kept, his, his collection has been kept intact exactly as he would have wanted it to be presented back in those days. So I suppose the great thing about Stone when you go into the museums, it is overwhelming. You know, you walk in, there are literally thousands of, of, of items within it. Um, but each room is presented as a work of art in its own right. And very much as the way that you described um, Hogarth's, you know, each, each drawing or each, um, each element, is that you sort of disappear into these rooms. And as you go into these rooms, every corner that you look at, you find something else that is going to influence you. And I think that, in some ways, is why artists, designers, makers, everyone, has found um, the museum itself um, a source of um, inspiration. So when I started, my job um, as, a, as the kind of commercial and operational person was what, what to do with the collection and how to, um, I suppose in some ways, encourage others to be influenced by it and to take it and to do interesting things with it. So I, um, I borrowed um, a, a sort of a, a, um, um, a term inspired by Sone that had already been developed for a fundraising campaign and used that to launch um, an inspired by Sone um, sort of uh, um, activation, which had a number of strands to it. One was asking designer makers and artists to respond um, to the collection and have sort of artistic um, outputs. Um, another, and then another part was highly commercial and was really about generating income for the mu much needed <laughs> income for the museum. And that was looking at both um, commercial licensees, so um, creating retail products, a product that you could buy in the shops, as well as um, really delving into the architectural interior design world, who, who were all obsessed with the collection and getting them to work um, with the collection. So I put together a few pictures, which I think will help sort of illustrate some of the work that we did together. And I'm hoping, like magic, that... Um, oh, there we go. So there's Soane. There he is. There's his bust. So interestingly, the great self-publicist um, places the bust of himself... I mean, it kind of could be Caesar, but it's not. It's Soane. And that is right in the middle of the room, with, which is filled with um, the classical sculpture at the back of the museum, just by the picture room, where the Rake's Progress and a number of other artworks are hanging. And one of the first projects we did was work with Royal College of Art alumni, students, um, and we took a 3D scan of the bust, which was the most frightening exercise that I think I've ever done, so we had a sort of handheld 3D scanner. And then we fragmented, created a, an actual physical replica of the bust and then fragmented it and gave um, a number of alumni students um, um, frag elements of this bust to go and turn into something that they thought would be interesting. And I grabbed two pictures, which I think is the next slide, of the two um, of the winning, um, we had several winners, but these were two winners um, who, I, who both got elements of his nose, which I always thought was highly humorous, but were really interesting ways that they were working um, with their fragment. So we've got one which is um, um, basically Sir John Soane's nose, and it was just the fragment of the nose reworked and as a kind of a piece of art that you could have on your shelf. So kind of, I, I suppose, it's slightly ironic because it looks like it's a classical fragment, but actually it's just a piece of his nose. And then the other one, um, Hannah Pittman's work, is that she had the bridge of his nose, which she had crafted um, into this beautiful um, object that you hang on your ne necklace basically a sort of pendant but what she'd very cleverly done is she'd written uh, her own history of Soane, a reworking of his history on a, on a scroll which was roll rolled up and actually inserted into this um, into the bridge of his nose but we had another a number of um, winners of the of the fragments of the bust and that was really the beginning of some of the work um, that we did 
So moving on, we then got involved in London Design Festival um, and I worked with this great curatorial team called um, Studio Portobal, um, so Tetsua and Bridget, who are kind of a duo, who um, agreed to curate our first, um, in fact it was our second London Design Festival intervention in the museum, which was called Pieces. And they worked with a number of artists, maker and designers and um, all types of designers to kind of, again, respond to the museum as a whole. And I think this next slide is actually their version of um, their response um, to this concept of pieces. And I think the thing that they were very um, touched or, or were thinking, but the thought we were thinking about is that what's fascinating about the fragments that Sohn has within his collection is not just the fragment itself, but what is it a part of and what is the missing, what is the missing piece? And so their um, artwork was really trying to work with that concept of different elements and pieces and then connecting it into a whole and presenting it back to us as an interesting object um, in its own right. So that was a lot of fun. Um, as time went on um, and the uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund was coming to a close, the opening up the zone where the opening of the rooms, the kind of the private spaces, which I always think are really fascinating in, in historic houses, not just the big kind of grand presentation, presentational spaces, but the places that you don't normally see and the stories that they tell. Um, and with the opening of the Soane, we, the museum opened up the top floor, so that's with the kind of the living quarters with Soane's amazing model rooms. So if anyone hasn't been, you must go when it reopens in October. Um, and also his bedroom and um, bathroom. And just sort of following on legacy, a very small little story on legacy. Someone who's quite obsessed with legacy is that he um, locked into his bath um, something, no one really knew what it was, but had bequeathed as one of his kind of um, elements of his will was that it needed to be opened at periodic times after he was dead. And, and they were essentially kind of PR moments where the press would come for the grand opening of this bath. And on the first opening, um, they pulled out essentially, it was old paperwork and some gloves and some, I think it's false teeth, can you remember? I can't remember, it was something so bizarre and so kind of <laughs> nonsensical. And really it was just, a, not all was just a kind of a setup to kind of make sure the press were back in the house kind of thinking about it. But anyway, moving on. We decided to um, work with the curator, Rachel Bar Barraclough, and who curated this um, fantastic um, exhibition um, in the kitchens which had never been opened before to the public and I knew instinctively as the um, non-curator in the room as a visitor that everyone loves the kitchens and actually we needed to really animate those spaces because there was nothing in them there was you know that it wasn't a part in the, of the bequest there was literally nothing in them so Rachel got a number of um, interior designer um, um, designers in, involved from the kind of the big names like Barbara and Osgaby and um, uh, and Morrison, uh, Jasper Morrison, and various other people um, to try and work with the spaces in the kitchen. And the piece there, that picture there, was a, um, was, um, a piece by um, Paul Coxedge, which was really around um, use, playing with Soane's kind of obsession with light and applying that principle to a really um, boring back kitchen. <laughs> it's essentially a space that was of no kind of historical curatorial um, interest because there was no objects within it. But what he wanted to do was, was apply a really um, interesting kind of use of the kind of the yellow light. And it, this looks like a very simple piece, but I cannot tell you how complicated it was because we had to get permission to put film on the windows that were in the, you know, that were, you know, part of a grade one listed building, etc., etc. But anyway, what it did is it brought this kind of warm glow to this extraordinary, you know, very small, basic kind of domestic space as part of that opening. So we had a lot of fun with that, but at the same time, my job ultimately was to make money um, surplus for the, for the museum. And so what I also did was work with um, commercial partners to um, work with the collection and, and to generate income. So the next picture was a fantastic collaboration we did with Dr. Martins, who were obsessed with the Rake's progress. So the creative director came to us and we kind of walked around the museum, we looked at all the artworks, but she said it's got to be the Rake's progress. And so um, we gave them the permission to do this. I thought that um, ev uh, you know, the director at the time would be, you know, you've got to be joking, but everyone loved it. I mean, it was an absolutely fantastic bit of fun that we had um, with, the, um, with the artworks and then getting them onto the product. 
And in fact, I think we, in, in the end, we managed to get several pairs and, and all our visitor, not all of them, but a number of our visitor assistants used to wear the Rake's Prose Progress Dr. Martins um, as they worked in the museum. Anyway, it was brilliant. And moving on from that, so one of the um, worlds that, were, that is massively influenced by Sohn and Hogarth um, um, uh, uh, are, are, is the interior design world, and they are continuously in the museum looking for influences and, and where to go. So we were approached by Decorex, which is a big design show, and they wanted to use um, the, um, the Rex Progress um, as the, um, inf as the um, influence for the vignettes, the kind of the entrance into the design show. And a number of designers were given, um, and this is the orgy, as recreated by Russell Sage um, and um, Fremantal, who's a, um, a fabric um, manufacturer. And they were given that vignette to recreate, um, um, and that, that is a picture of it. It was a full-scale vignette in the entrance to Decorex. And in return, so as part of my wheeler dealing, so I'm being so an entrepreneur here, um, I um, got um, a, a stand, an opportunity for the museum to exhibit Decorex as an opportunity for us to showcase the collection and to really make sure that all the interior designers and who were visiting the show realised that they could come and, and work with our collection, that we were essentially open for business. So I think the next slide um, picture gives us a... Um, there we go. Now, I can't take the credit for that stand because that actually um, was put together by Adam Thau, who took over from me um, and did, I think, an absolutely superb job. And you can see that he's worked, work, that's all showcasing different um, commercial partners that had, were working with the collection. Some doing straightforward replicas with, you know, um, um, that, that's an Adam's um, fireplace or with um, drawings collection, or you can see on a writer's stand, that would have been, that was a replica of a sewn stand and then a model, etc. And then some, I think on the next slide, are um, working with the collection and then being influenced it to create something new. And again, I can't take credit for this, this is my, leg this is my legacy. <laughs> so this was taken on by the people that carried on after me and worked with this fantastic duo called Black Pop, who we'd met at Decorex. In fact, I met, met them in the first year. And they were obs also obsessed by Sohn and his collection. They really delved into not just the collection that you can see, but this amazing um, works of art collection behind the scenes of drawings, etc., and created what they called the Collector's Collection, where they meshed um, all sorts of different influences in to create this fabric. Um, and so you can, you can re-upholster your chairs in, in that collection, should you wish. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So they have the right to Hogarth, basically, because they own Virus, the Virus, yes. That's but to use yeah. it, is it a, li, li, um, a, 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 as a license, as a licensee, license. so limited yeah. with yeah. income yeah. coming back to the museum. But the great thing about um, working with partners like that, art, all kinds of partners, is it's not just a question of... Um, you know, money, obviously, as, as the as all Claire and I ever talk about, it, is how are we going to generate income? But it's also a great way of... Um, bringing in new audiences and seeing how collections can still influence us today and how much fun you can have with it as well. It does not have to all be serious, but you can actually have a huge amount of fun um, working with these inspirations from the past. And I, I always think that our, our Hogarth and our Sohn and our Turners are all probably looking at us now thinking, yeah, you know, I, my legacy continues and in some ways that's our role as directors to look for those opportunities. I want to bring in Claire at this point because, again, that's what you've done with your e e exhibition. Uh, it's not just the paintings, it's, uh, it, it's how people have reflected on that. But I'd also like to hear your relationship with the Sir John Stone Museum yes. because I'm sure that yes. is fascinating. Yes, no, absolutely. And I'll just pick up on something that as Anthony was saying. I think Soan himself had a great sense of humour and he was always taking the mickey in his, in his architecture as well and you used to come around a place and you'd expect it to be one thing and you were completely surprised by another thing. So I think there's a, there's a real sense of picking up on that which is fun. Um, as regards our relationship with the John Soane Museum, so we, Pitsanger is John Soane's country house, Lincoln's Inn's Fields, the Sir John Soane Museum is, is his London house. So we're very similar to houses that he poured passion into. Pitsanger is the one where he invested his passion when he still had these great aspirations for his sons. And then young George follows the story of Tom Rakewell and, mm. as Anthony was saying, ends up himself in debtor's prison and in a ménage à trois. So the story, the story really is very, very entwined. So Pitsanger has more of the, the sadness of shattered 
illusion, shattered dreams of what he'd hoped he'd set up Pitsang as the future dynasty. But it's great fun because the Stone Museum and Pitsanger are two sides of the Stone character. And um, the John Stone Museum is, as I think was saying, packed full of Stone's collection. Mm -hmm. Pitsanger's collection is all at the John Stone Museum. So the Rake's Progress went to the John Stone Museum when, um, when Stone had to sell Pitsanger in 1810. So everything that Stone had at Pitsanger is now at the John Stone Museum. And I think that's quite interesting because it means that in Pitsanger you see the building, you really look at the architecture. And what I think has been enormous fun with us borrowing back a rake's progress to Pitsanger is as Xanthi was saying, when you're in the Stone Museum, every time you go into a room, yes, you can see wonderful artifacts and items, but you're also seeing this construct, this sort of piece of interior decoration. You're looking at a creation, at a, at a stage set. But sometimes as a result, you're so bamboozled by what you're seeing, you can't absorb the individual details. And what I'm loving about having um, a Rake's Progress sitting in the gallery at Pitsanger is you can go and look at every single one of them at eye level and look at them at detail. And in a way, I feel we're giving, I hope Sir John C. Museum will forgive me for saying this, we're giving a Rake's Progress a holiday. It can come away from where it's been in this intensely very busy atmosphere and we can just focus on those paintings without being bamboozled by the other amazing paintings that are around in the picture room. And I think Hogarth paintings are worthy of, of that long, lingering look. And you can do what Martin was saying, is see those crazy other stories that Hogarth creates around. He's telling the story of Tom Rakewell, but in the background, there are all these other things going on. And it's great fun to have the chance to sort of look at him do that. I mean, it's also the other thing about Hogarth. I mean, he certainly thought he was a great painter. Um, and a lot of people agreed with him. And actually, it's in uh, the election series, the chairing of the candidate. In the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little clump of flowers by the side of the river, which is one of the most beautiful still lifes in 18th century art, I think. It's, it's just extraordinarily beautiful and well wrought. And he was a, he was a, a phenomenally good painter, um, as well as an engraver, as well as a businessman, um, as, as well as a, a Mickey taker. I mean, but you're talking about fun, having fun. Uh, as I said, you know, a lot of this stuff was specifically meant, certainly the satirical stuff was specifically meant to be fun, but also to be journalism, and to an extent to be disposable, though he was very conscious of his legacy. Um, and a few years ago, there was an exhibition at the Tate Britain about Hogarth, which, which I thought was a travesty in many ways, because they were taking the prints they were contemporaneous prints, so they had to be treated with curatorial, literally kid gloves. And they were hanging them more or less in a dark room, and they were that big, and people would walk straight past them having no idea what they were. Whereas, in fact, because Gin Lane, for example, was created specifically to be reproduced, they could have projected it onto the moon. Yeah. And it was what Hogarth would have wanted, or recreated it. I think it would be fantastic for somebody to actually make a full-size model of Gin Lane in the, in the Hogarth Museum we're going to launch in 2030, and you can sort of go in there and get drunk. What was the relationship between the paintings and the engravings? Which came first and how did it work? I think um, he always did the paintings first. Then he, um, being a great English patriot, uh, he would make the engravings himself, except in Marriage of a Mode where he brought some French people in to do it because he didn't have time, couldn't be bothered, and they were better craftsmen than him. Um, and then he would exhibit the paintings and he would put out uh, things like lottery tickets so you could uh, come and you, you'd get a ticket to go and see the paintings in his studios in Leicester Fields, Leicester Square as it is now. Um, and it would also be a lottery ticket, so you might be able to win a print. Clever. And so he'd get paid three times if he was, if he was being clever about it. But there's, there's a, um, you know, his first of these modern moral tales, which is how he described the progresses, which is of course an ironic title, because the progress is always a spiral into a death or syphilis or madness, it just gets worse and worse and worse. You know, which, but of course it's, it's, it's a gag, it's a joke, that's where the basis of humour is, we laughing about misfortune. Um, it was, was the Harlot's progress, uh, where we only have the prints, because the original paintings uh, were destroyed in a fire in the 18, sorry, the 1750s, um, and apparently in, in the, the house where this fire was happening, 
uh, there was a, a very elaborate organ which was heard to play deathly airs as the hot air rose up the pipes, which was a detail of the fire which interested Hogarth far more than the fate of the paintings. Uh, because, you know, it was that kind of whimsy, that kind of 18th century whimsy, and sort of black-hearted whimsy as well. You mentioned Harlots. John Collins, in his contribution, uh, mentioned the BBC uh, series Harlots, which, of course, uses lots of Hogarth images yeah. in, uh, I in the background. And we almost don't notice it now, do we? I mean, we just take it almost yes. for granted that Hogarth is uh, the way we just uh, measure those, sorts of, um, yes. those yes. sorts of things. Yes, and I think that's also one of the things we haven't talked about is, is the way that in these paintings and in these prints, he is anchoring it, and this is one of the things we've enjoyed playing with in the exhibition, he's anchoring it so much in a real place. So you can go through a rake's progress and identify the very streets in which different of the scenes, some of which are still there. So there's, there's when he's being arrested to go into debtor's prison, he is at the top of um, the street leading down to St James's, leading down to St James's Palace, and you could absolutely recognise and identify whose yeah. house they were. And the orgy takes place in a very well-known tavern mm. that is no more. But 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 you know, it's fun to actually identify those. Mm. But that's the other thing. He's also, um, you know, one of the first serious interrogators of the meaning of modern urbanism. Terribly mm. pompous way of saying he was the first biographer of London. You know, London was growing exponentially uh, after the Restoration, it was moving beyond Oxford Street into Soho, and, um, and there is Hogarth depicting this, the largest city the world had ever known, with no flush toilets. So you have these beautiful Georgian buildings and these people in their fantastic Frenchified fancy clothes, literally stepping over dead cats in, sh in sewers full of shit, because that was the nature of urbanism, you know, where most of the people actually slept in cellars 20 to a cellar and, until the clothes rotted off their backs. And he has no shyness to depict. So in the, he has, he the has no shyness about that. There is a, there is a chamber <coughs> pot emptied yeah. in a rather unpleasant way. So he has yeah. no shyness of I showing these yeah. dirty sights. Um, I once gave a talk about Hogarth where I just took um, all the emptying chamber pots. <laughs> <laughs> about 30 of them just brrr, go, go through it like that. Um, but, the, but, but of course, the other thing about Hogarth, I, I, earlier on I said, you know, he was Hogarthian. Um, but of course, he himself was not Hogarthian. We think of Hogarthian, uh, well, certainly as Robert Hughes described it, uh, of these slums being Hogarthian, that there's a kind of earthy robustiousness in what we think of the 18th century. Um, whereas he, like Swift, the reason he was a satirist was because he would walk through those streets with squashed cats in open sewers and walk round a corner and what you'd regularly see in George in London, see a child being publicly executed for stealing a bun. And rather than just walking past, he was actually horrified by it. That's the point. He was horrified by it. So at the same day as part of the campaign with Fielding against Gin that Gin Lane and Beer Street published, he also published The Stages of Cruelty, which I think is, is almost the perfect statement of, of where Hogarth's head was. Because he's depicting cruelty. So the first print is children being cruel to animals. The second print is, you know, growing up and being... Uh, cruel to women and gambling and whoring and all these other Hogarthian things. Third print is this man murders a prostitute and you're thinking, yes, this is Hogarth, this is, this is the 18th century, this is dark, this is the sort of the underbelly of, in the underclass of modern urbanism as it then was. But then the final print is the extraordinary one because it's the rewards of cruelty and it is the murderer suffering the fate which befell the underclass, um, where the British state would say that you could have your body anatomised mm. after you were hanged at Tyburn. And, and that is a serious penalty, because it means if your body is chopped up, you can never make it to heaven, and make it to heaven because your body will not be resurrected, because they believe in resurrection of the body. And it, it, is, a, it is an eternal punishment by the British mm. state in the name of the age of reason, because it was about science and rationality and the Lockean revolution and all that stuff, the sort of the age of reason, the enlightenment, and a terrible, terrible fate for the underclass. And suddenly Hogarth tips our sympathies entirely on their head. And we see this person laid out on a slab, being chopped up by these anonymous doctors, and there's, his, and there's a, a cauldron full of bones being boiled, boiled. It's like a cannibal feast. And you suddenly think, this is the price of reason, this is the price of learning and anatomy, and it's exactly like Swift, 
I mean, it, it, it is suddenly tearing apart your expectations. And as a sort of little by digression from that, interestingly, Lawrence Stern, who wrote Tristram Shandy, uh, and Hogarth did the frontispieces for volumes one and two of, of Tristram Shandy, um, Stern was dug up by the anatomy men after he died and was about to be sliced from chin to pubis <laughs> on the chopping block in the anatomy schools in Cambridge when they pulled back the shroud and said, that's Lawrence Stern, because he was so famous, even in the age of full photography, they knew what he looked like. Oh my God, it's Lawrence Stern, so they quickly reburied him. And they've been sold the body, yeah. basically. Yeah, they've been sold the body. And I, I did a series of Hogarthian prints about Stern's life for Shandy Hall. And there is one of him lying on the slab, Stern lying on the slab, in an imitation of that. I was just going to say, it's interesting you're talking about um, um, Hogarth and his, you know, what he was trying to achieve through his, his cartoons and, and his morality. And uh, Sone is an interesting guy. Sone is a, definitely a flawed genius, mm, a definitely. challenging man in so many ways. But I think one of the truly inspirational things that Sone did is, ahead of his time, he wanted, through his two houses, to set them up as places where other people like him could learn and to use them as places where they would see inspirational architecture, inspirational mm. paintings. And I think that was a really special legacy that he had. And, and by this crazy idea, how many of us had this crazy idea, I am going to make sure an act of parliament is, 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 is passed so that my house can remain there as um, a museum forevermore. And wow, how he succeeded, as you said. So none of his collection has been dissipated. But it was this... Yes, he was an arrogant man. Yes, he wanted to have a legacy more than anything else. But there was something really special about wanting to inspire the next generation of artists, designers and architects. Agreed. Think, yeah, but then do you think disinheriting his son as well? well I mean, they see that, see, yeah. that's the well, whole, you know, going back to what you were saying. There's yeah, all no. sorts of questions yeah. about that as yeah. well, because at the time there was a bit of... Um, you know, getting it through, through Parliament was challenging because people did not fundamentally agree with disinheriting your son just because you disapprove of the of the behavior of your son which essentially is what what he was um doing i mean i i think what's interesting going back to that kind of the moral twist of the fact that the boys grew up with these these moralistic kind of as you said you know, kind of quite um and get you know you can't avoid the moral story within those um vignettes and yet it obviously didn't influence their behaviour at all. But I, you, there is something around, well, why did he hang them in Pitt's hangar? You know, why did he choose to have such... Um, you know, they're quite revolting in some way <laughs> in, in the, what was essentially supposed to be the peaceful family country home that his wife and children spent more time at than he did. It was where <coughs> they spent their time. So I always think that's quite interesting as well about the role of, the, of, that, of that series of painting, why that was in Pitt's hangar. Um, specifically given all the artworks that he had yeah. in the house yeah. at the time. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. We've got, well, we have united Pitsanger, um, Chiswick House and Hogarth House. What more can you do to get together and sort of uh, promote yourselves as somewhere that people in West London ought to be, uh, ought to be coming to? So many things, I think. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. it's finding those connections and those stories that people can then make those paths. I mean, you could actually start in the um, graveyard, because <laughs> the graveyard itself is fascinating, and then, <laughs> and then make your way around. Grab a, grab a bottle of gin, go on the pub well, call. I, 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 so, um, I don't know about, about Hogarth, but I know that Soane was a great walker. Mm. He and Turner used to walk to Pitsanger from his house in, in Twickenham. Soane used to walk to Pitsanger from Lincoln's and Fields. He was a great walker. So what I want to inspire people to do is we'll the give you some routes, do some walking, walking tour between Hogarth's house, Chiswick house, Pitsanger, and do that fun thing of seeing how the architecture changes over the years. Well, I think that would be a wonderful memorial um, to them and to also this session because I think it's been fascinating. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. There are lots more sessions in our virtual uh, Chiswick Book Festival uh, and I hope you'll tune in for some more. But uh, please at home at least thank our panellists very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>